Hi, my name is Justine Debelius. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Center for Translational Microbiome Research at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm, Sweden, where I study the interaction between the human microbiome and cancer. Today, I want to talk to you about sample metadata, which is some of the most important data in your microbiome study, and it's data you'll likely never sequence. I want to talk to you about what sample metadata is, do you need it, where do you get it, and what are the requirements that are hard requirements, and what are some recommendations for it. So let's start with where it fits into the context of your study. As you're performing a microbiome study, hopefully you started with a really interesting question that you want to answer, and you designed a study that would let you answer that question. You went out and you collected some samples, you sequenced them, maybe you did it in-house, maybe you sent them out for sequencing, and now you're at this workshop where we're going to help you understand how to make a feature table and how to do some statistics to answer that research question. However, your ability to answer that research question and do your important work comes back to having metadata so that you can do those statistics at the end. When you go to collect your metadata, the first most important thing you want to make sure you have is information about your main exposure, the thing that you're really researching. If you're doing a study of soils and location, you want to make sure that you have the longitude and latitude. If you're interested in humans and disease status, you need to know whether or not the person has the disease or is clinically healthy. If you want to look at mice and genotype, you want to make sure that you know what genotype your mice are. Make sure that you have this information. I will be honest and say that I have worked on multiple studies in the last year where the collaborator forgot to collect the information and it just makes it really hard to actually do the work they want to do. The second thing you want to think about is factors that could affect the microbiome that are either related to that main exposure or that might just affect the community. So for example, Age is a factor that affects the microbiome in humans. So you probably want to collect information about the age of your participants in your disease study, especially if there's a difference in age between the cases and controls. If we think about the soil study, maybe you're going to include information about pH, about salinity, about temperature, because those potentially have an effect on the microbiome, and that could be bigger than the effect of longitude and latitude, and you should know about it. If you're looking at mice, you probably want to think about including information about cage or other things that are going on with the mice. So you just want to make sure you have this information. The third kind of data you want to collect is technical information. How were the samples sequenced? How were they stored? Where were they sequenced? You're going to need this information later, both in terms of publication, but also just in terms of being able to do analysis and account for potential differences there. Speaking of publication and what to include, there's actually a community standard called the MIX-S, or Minimum Information for Any Sequence Standard. This standard is used by common repositories like ENA, where hopefully you'll deposit your sequences when you publish your study. ENA provides information about how the project was conducted, the technical information, but it also gives you some standards for collecting your own information about different environments and how to format that. And the goal with this is both that you can answer questions when you do deposition, but also that you know where your samples came from. And MixS has a lot of really nice standardized terminology and ontologies. So when you go to do a meta-analysis at some point in the future, your metadata is comparable and you don't spend three weeks trying to standardize different information. When you go to format your metadata for chime and for your specific analysis, I think there's often an inclination to start with just having two columns, an ID column and a description column. Maybe you decide to have one more column that's, you know, your main exposure or whatever, but you start with two columns. And this becomes really hard to analyze statistically because as we do statistics, we need multiple samples per group to be able to look for a distribution in those samples. So instead, I want to recommend that you separate your data into different columns. So here, instead of having the description column, I've got a donor column, a cage column, an individual column, and a day column. I like to format this data as a string that's a little bit more descriptive, because then when I make my figures and stuff, I can look at it and I can know the answer. 
If this doesn't work for you for whatever reason, I recommend using the Q2 types functionality as you put together your data, and you can specify whether a column is a category, even if you code it as a zero or a one, or a number. And this is just useful as you think about how you format your metadata. I also want to mention that within Chime, there is one additional hard requirement for your metadata which is that the first column needs to be an ID column, and there is a constrained number of ways you can represent that ID. I recommend looking at the Chime metadata tutorial to specifically understand that, and you can use Kime, which is an online plugin for your Google Doc, if you can put your metadata into Google that can help validate it. The other issue I just wanna mention as you're preparing your metadata is that Excel is a really popular way to do it, I like Excel, I recommend it. However, with Excel, you wanna be really careful with the formatting. There is a great historic example where somebody went in and checked a bunch of, of human gene studies and discovered that there were mistakes in it because Excel had changed the gene name to a date in an effort to be helpful. So as you're doing your metadata in Excel, just pay attention to those details and double check it early on. And you can always like cast it to text if you look at the cell format menu, but just make sure that as you're recording your metadata in Excel or in something similar that it's formatting correctly. So let's come back to those questions that we asked at the beginning. So first of all, do you need sample metadata? Yes, absolutely. If you don't have your metadata, you're not going to be able to answer your biological question. You're going to be left with a bunch of sequences and you're essentially going to be trying to do molecular fortune telling, but like without any ad additional information. Where do you get your metadata? You should be collecting it at the beginning of your study. You should be thinking about how to format it at the beginning of your study, and you should have it in hand ready to go before you start analyzing your data. And finally, what are the hard requirements for your metadata? Well, Chime has some hard requirements that you include specific labels for the first column. If you plan to deposit, MIMARC standards are a hard requirement for many of the places you will want to deposit your data upon publication. And then there are some recommendations like making sure that your metadata is in multiple columns that will make it easier to analyze. I hope this talk has been useful for you. I hope you understand a little bit more about metadata, about why you need it, and hopefully you will have amazing metadata in the future. Thank you so much for listening.